Hi, everyone. My name is Dory Clark. I teach for Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. I'm the author of a number of books from Harvard Business Review Press, including most recently, Entrepreneurial You. And I am delighted to be here today with the amazing Hubert Jolie. He is the former CEO and former chairman of Best Buy. And right at this moment, the author of the fantastic new book, The Heart of Business, which he is launching and premiering here at South by Southwest. Hubert, wonderful to have you here. Dory, thank you for being here. I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. So, Hubert, the, the first obvious question for a, a business leader like you at this time, things have been a little strange the past year. This has been absolutely uh, unprecedented for the last century. You had a rather unique view. You ended your tenure as chairman of Best Buy uh, last June. So it was after the pandemic had already started, you were in the thick of the pandemic response, and you've now gotten to see uh, from, from both sides, from inside a corporation and now outside the response to it. What is your perspective as someone who has immersed yourself as a, a corporate leader in how the situation has changed for businesses overall and what good leadership actually looks like in the time of COVID. And, and Dory, and it's about the, the theme of the, of the conference. So it's, the, we're facing some problems in the world because it's not just the pandemic. Of course, in Minneapolis, that's where Best Buy is based. We've had the killing, the murder of George Floyd. And then we are all aware of global warming. So it's, there's no doubt that the world is facing unprecedented very significant challenges. What I've learned during this crisis and certainly beginning uh, you know, at the time of the, the beginning of the pandemic, I've seen leaders lead from a place of purpose and humanity. And this was unescapable. The first priority at Best Buy was to take care of our, cust of our employees, the safety of our employees and the safety of our customers. This was not about you know, the quarterly earnings, this was about that. And it was also about our, our mission. Uh, initially people thought maybe Best Buy, we can close Best Buy. Actually, of course, with everybody working from home, learning from home, eating at home, we were deemed an essential retailer and we had to pursue our mission, our purpose to help people with their lives with the, the help of technology. But we had to do it in a safe way. And that meant we saw leaders really see you know, the whole person. You know, when people are working from home, you know, you cannot ignore their family, their cats, their children, maybe their children first and their cats second. When people are going to the stores or going to people's homes, what about their safety? And then when we had the murder of George Floyd, you know, when the city, when the world is literally on fire, you cannot run a business, right? The, the stores, the Target stores, the Best Buy stores were closed. So this was a reminder that, you know, we need a declaration of interdependence between all of our stakeholders. And this was a great reminder of this. And businesses can be a great force for good. We need to do well, to do good by, by excuse me, to do well by doing good. That means taking care of the community and making sure that we play our role in ending systemic racism. So this was, in a sense, maybe for some, a wake up call for all of us, a calling to lead from a place of purpose and, and humanity. And my wonderful successor, Corey Barry at Best Buy, I think is one of the most admirable leaders in, in that context. And of course, there were so many great examples of that. There's no way we go back to the way it was before. That's the, uh, I think that's the shining sign for, for me. Yeah, those are some really important points you bear. A question I just wanna zero in on, one of the hardest aspects of being a leader is the fact that you are responsible for decision making in times of extreme uncertainty. And I'm wondering if you can actually just take us back to March of 2020, when all of this with COVID is starting to unfurl. Information is incomplete. There's rumors, there's speculation. People don't know how serious or not serious it is. What did the decision making process look like? You talked about the fact that the, the safety of your employees and your customers was paramount. How did you actually think things through during those times when so much was up in the air? Yeah, and this is a time, you know, this is a the opportunity to rethink leadership. Leadership is not about, you know, being a superhero. This is not about being the smartest person in the room, the person who saves the day. This was about 
being open. So knowing what we didn't know, there was so much we didn't know. So Corey and the board and the management team, we looked for answers. We looked for the, to the scientists. We talked with other leaders in the industry to see how people were doing. We asked, you know, we asked our, the Geek Squad agents, tell us what you need to feel safe to go back into people's homes. So I think it's the model of the uh, vulnerable leader who is here to serve, who doesn't mind saying, this is what I don't know, who's very human and authentic. And there was tough decisions at Best Buy, you know, we had to furlough 51,000 of our employees. And so the think about the communication to these employees. And so of course we waited for as long as possible. Again, we didn't focus on the short-term earnings, but we waited until the federal program kicked in so that our employees on furlough could stay on employee on healthcare benefits. And then there was a direct communication to these furloughed employees explaining why we had to come to this and then keeping an ongoing communication uh, you know, during the, the time when they were furloughed. And for me, the leadership implication is also about, you know, so we said, you know, we, it was a lockdown, so you couldn't go outside. For me, as a leader, if you cannot go outside, you have to go inside. And it was really important for us as leaders to slow down, meditate, take the time to meditate. How do I want to be remembered as a leader? What's going to be important? What are the parameters? around uh, how we're gonna make decisions. And by the way, you, you made the point, Dory, that the CEO is the big decision maker. Actually, that's not true. There's so few decisions that the CEOs get to make. You know, maybe the strategy was in the executive team, the big structure, you know, the maybe big investments, the culture values, but it's really a handful of decisions. If all of the decisions are made by the CEO, it slows things down to a grind. And so it's much better to say, okay, so these are the guidelines, the guardrails. These are the parameters. This is what's important. And then empower Damien Harmon, who is the head of operations at Best Buy. Within these guardrails, you make the decisions about which stores to open, with what conditions, uh, and so forth. So you, the key is to, uh, the, the key for leaders today is not to be the smartest person in the room, but just to create the environment in which others can be successful and unleash. For me, the biggest lesson at Best Buy during the turnaround and the resurgence of Best Buy is, was to unleash human magic, creating the environment in which 125,000 people can do, you know, can be the, the, the best version of themselves and can do great things for each other and for customers. Hubert, you mentioned creating the right environment for success. That's something I wanna zoom in on. Because if we actually go back in time to when you first accepted the position at Best Buy, things looked pretty bleak. Uh, a lot of people were writing off Best Buy. They were writing off, re you know, these retail big box stores. They said, "No, that is that is dead." Uh, you came in. The stock price was eleven. You actually managed to bring it up to one hundred and ten. It was a ten x increase. Why were you not afraid to come into a situation like that? What did you see in that situation that everybody else was writing off? And how were you able to effectuate such a change? Yeah, so, so many questions. So, Dory, when I got the call from our common friend, Jim Citrin at Spencer Stewart, telling me about this job, I said, Jim, you're crazy, right? Which is actually the opening lines in the, in the book, because I had zero retail experience and the place seemed to be a mess. But Jim, who's a good friend, convinced me to uh, look at it because he thought that it was a, a good fit. So I took the time to study from the outside before uh, having the interviews with, uh, with the board. And what I saw is two things. One, uh, it was clear that there was a role, an important role for Best Buy to play for customers and vendors. Because at our best, you know, People need technology, but sometimes technology, it's hard to choose, it's hard to configure, configure, put together, keep going. And so they need, a, many people, many of us need a place where we can see, touch and feel the product and ask questions to other human beings. So big role to play vis-a-vis -vis, uh, customers and then big role to play for the vendors. Uh, you know, the, the, the world's foremost tech companies spend billions of dollars to develop great products. But if the, if the product shift just sit on a shelf or is just online, you know, take a TV, picture quality is a big buying factor. 
The only place in the world where you can see the quality of a picture of a TV is in a store. And so they need a place where to showcase, at the time people were talking about showrooming, but they talk, they, we need, they need a place where to showcase their, their products. So they, customers need us, vendors need us. But the second thing I realized is that all of the problems that Best Buy had at the time were self-inflicted. The previous team was complaining about headwinds, you know, price deflation, the business moving online. And so I actually told our team when I started, I pretended I had called Tim Cook and Jeff Bezos and said, Jeff and Tim, how is the wind where you're sailing? Oh, the bear, the wind is just fabulous. We're having the time of our lives. Okay, wind, not the problem. We must be the problem. And that was great news story because then we could fix that. And so then to your question about, so what did we do? People who thought we were gonna die, which was pretty much everybody thought that uh, what we had to do was cut, cut, cut. Close doors, cut head counts. We did the opposite. We started with people. Spend the first week on the job working in stores in St. Cloud, Minnesota, listening to the frontliners, trying to understand what was not going well, what was the tools they were missing. So for example, one of the things they told me is that, but you know, the search engine on the site is not working. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, well, type Cinderella, you'll find Nikon cameras not quite the same. And there was a lot of stuff that I uncovered that I would never have been able to uncover, you know, looking at spreadsheets in headquarters. Building the team at the top was the, uh, you know, other thing, you need a good team. We all know this in business, right? It's all about the team. And then, so it's starting with people, but it's also ending with people. I have this turnaround manual, Dolly, where the first priority in a turnaround is you grow the top line. Growing the top line creates all sorts of uh, good things. As you're going to go after costs, and we, di we did need to go after costs at Best Buy, first focus on what I call non-salary expenses, which is all of the costs that have nothing to do with people. So for example, we sell a lot of TVs. They're big, they're thin, they're very fragile. Therefore, we break a lot of TVs. At the time, maybe let's say $200 million worth of TVs we would break every year. That's a lot. If you can reduce what we call TV junk out by 50%, that's a $100 million saving. And it's good for the customers and it's good for the employees and for the bottom line. Nobody wants to buy a broken TV, right? So how cool is that? And then if growing the revenue and cutting non-salary expenses is not sufficient, you may have to go after a headcount, but you do this as a last resort. And still, if you're going to do that, and we did have to... For example, we closed some small standalone uh, uh, Best Buy mobile stores, which was a small part of the business. Then you can redeploy the people because the people are not the problem. The people are not a resource. They are the source. They are the alpha and the omega in, in business, right? You really think about this. And then we told the affected employees, no, don't go away. We'll find you another job at the, at the company. Because you know, in retail, you have 30% turnover. So how difficult is this? So, it was, we really did the opposite. And then it's all about creating energy, which we can talk about more, but as a leader, again, it's not about being the smartest person in the room, but uh, it's unleashing the energy that exists within the, the company, rebuilding the confidence and keep everybody going. So that's what we did in a nutshell. Well, thank you for walking through that. And you touched on something important, Hubert, that I want to get more of your thoughts on. So, the conventional wisdom, of course, uh, since since uh, Milton Friedman was banging the drum, is that what businesses need to focus on, the only thing that they should be keeping their eyes on is returns for shareholders. Now, your book, The Heart of Business, the subtitle of this, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism, you think that perhaps uh, th there is a new way of looking at things. What do you recommend? Milton Friedman is dead. And aside from a human standpoint, at least from a philosophical standpoint, I'm very happy about this. The excessive pursuit of profit is poisonous, it's dangerous. I've said to our shareholders, our purpose as a company is not to make money. Our purpose as a company is not to make, it's an imperative to make money, but that's not our purpose. So the vision we need for this new era of capitalism is a, it's actually simple to understand. I think most people embrace this now. 
It's the idea that uh, at the end of the day, a company is a human organization made of individuals working together in pursuit of a goal. And if we think about the goals in our lives, it's not about making money. Of course, we need the money, but it's not the ultimate goal. And so business has to be pursuing what I call a noble purpose. And our good friend Lisa McLeod also has coined that phrase, which is a, uh, addressing human needs in the world that are important. And so it's really make, about making a positive difference uh, in the world. So that's the first idea. The second idea is that you put people at the center. If it's a, a company is a human organization, people are, again, the, the source, they have the energy. And the key thing we'll talk about is that, uh, you know, how do you connect the individual purpose of people working at the company with the purpose of the company? If you're working at a company whose purpose is nothing to do with your purpose, you should probably leave, except if you're the decision maker on what the purpose should be. And then it's about building these, these connections between people working at the company and the and their customers or the clients, and you know nurturing a, a love relationship, right? To build a uh, you know the, the the love for the brand. It's about partnering with the vendors as opposed to squeezing with the vendors. One of the big coup at Best Buy was to partner with all of the world's foremost tech companies, including Amazon, and help them commercialize their, the fruit of their billions of dollars of R and D investment. It's about taking care of the community uh, in, in a genuine way, like we, we've talked about. If the community is burning, it's not going to work. And it's taking care of shareholders. Shareholders are actually important because they're going to take care of our retirement, right, Dory? So we care about this. But you treat profit as an outcome. If you, if you have great people who are mobilized and energized, who take care of customers and bring great service or products to customers, financial outcomes, good financial outcome will, will result. So it's a different way of thinking about it. Easy to understand, hard to do. And the book that I'm so excited to launch uh, on, uh, in, a, in a few weeks is about how you do this. So it's really a, a guide or you know, a manual on how to, you know, it's for leaders who are aspiring to lead from a place of purpose and, and humanity giving them to the, the, the tools to unleash human magic. Uh, and that's how I think we reinvent business, we reinvent capitalism to create a more sustainable future. The definition of madness is hoping that you do the same thing and it gets to a you know, different outcome. No, we have to fundamentally change how we've approached business. And what's very exciting is that more and more people uh, on this journey, and I'm excited to be able to, you know, contribute, add my voice and my energy to this necessary foundation. Yeah, thank you for that, Hubert. And I would love to hear just a little bit more about the noble purpose concept. You mentioned uh, our mutual friend, Lisa Earl McLeod, the author of Leading with Noble Purpose, who um, helped inspire this. And I, I am curious, Many people listening to this might say, noble purpose, you know, that sounds great, but, you know, my company doesn't do solar energy or, you know, my company doesn't feed the homeless. How does noble purpose come into play for more traditional corporations? Is, is this about uh, social change or what do you mean by noble purpose? And, and there's a danger, which is to stay at a very superficial level, right? Because now that purpose is so, you know, fashionable, you see many companies write their noble purpose and then nothing happens. For me, it, it connects with first a personal reflection, right? Which is why, why am I working? What's, what's my purpose? What's the meaning of my life? And I think most of us, you know, when you ask people, they want to make a positive difference in the world. They want to make a positive difference on people around them. And so for, for business, it's the same. And, and you don't need to be saving lives uh, or in healthcare or in solar to do this. So let's take the very concrete example of Best Buy. You could see Best Buy as a brick and mortar retailer selling gadgets. And by the way, if that's how we had defined the business, we would be dead by now, <laughs> for sure. Uh, We've defined our purpose after considerable work, and that was this something that was co-created by the, by the team. Our purpose is to enrich lives through, through technology 
by addressing key human needs. And so that can be, uh, you know, the human needs can be health, can be uh, entertainment, can be education, can be productivity, can be, you know, food, all of the, you know, needs in the Maslowian pyramid of, uh, of needs. And uh, we didn't leave it at the superficial level, it had implications. So let me give you a few to make it very concrete. So that opened us new markets for us. We went into the health business, it, helping aging seniors stay in their home and live in their home independently longer through the help of technology. So that means we put sensors under their bed, under their sofa, in the kitchen, in the bathroom, fall detection. And with artificial intelligence and remote monitoring, we can detect whether something bad is gonna to happen to that frail senior and then trigger an intervention. If we had thought about Best Buy as a brick and mortar retailer, we would never have gone into that space. And so uh, pursuing a noble purpose expands the addressable market. Also unleashes new ways of working. So let me take another example. You know, if you're redoing your family room or your kitchen or your patio, uh, it's, a, it's a complex need. It's hard to really have the conversation in the store or online, right? Because it depends on the walls and, and it's hard to describe. So we've launched a program that everybody can use called in-home advisors. Like a designer, we'll come to your home for free and we'll have the conversation with you and your family about your needs uh, and we'll create a solution. You'll have the opportunity to say yes or no to the solution. And then of course, with our teams, uh, we'll make it happen. And then we can become your CIO or your CTO for your home, right? Because our homes are becoming more and more complex and we have new needs all the time as the family changes. So we also introduce, by the way, another service, which is called Total Tech Support, where we'll support everything in your home, whether irrespective of where you bought it. So if Netflix is not working tonight, is it because of Netflix, the pipe into the home? you know, the streamer, the, the router, the, you know, the TV, honey, what is it? And we are honey. So we can truly be your CIO and CTO. You, we can build a relationship with you. So it completely changes the business and it creates a, a competitive advantage because who else can actually do this? So that's how we were able to survive in this world of digital and Amazon and so forth is by creating this unique position. So it expands the market makes it easier to create a competitive advantage. And then it's so inspiring for people because then you can change the life of Jack, 85 years old, or you know, this family uh, and help create a better life for them. So that's the practical application of pur noble purpose in, in business. I think that's really interesting, Hubert. And it actually brings me to a point that for me was one of the most memorable parts of your book, where you talk about when you were CEO, you would often be visiting stores in the field, learning from what they were doing. And you talk about a notable example when you visited a store in Boston, the South Bay Best Buy. I used to live in Boston, so I'd drive, uh, drive past it and, and you know wa wave to it all the time. Uh, you had a, a notable- I hope you encounter. stopped at the store as well, Dory, from time oh, to time. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so tell us a little bit more about what you learned uh, from the South Bay Best Buy. So, you know, in a business like Best Buy, you learn so much from other leaders and frontliners. So the store general manager um, was doing one thing. So in a store at Best Buy, you probably have 100 associates. The store manager would ask every one of the associates working in the store, what is your dream? Tell me about your dream at Best Buy or outside of Best Buy. Okay, write it down in the break room. Now, my job, my role as the store general manager together with the team is to help you achieve your dream. And I thought this was a magical idea because I don't know about you guys, but I remember when I was 16, working actually in a retail store in France where I grew up. And, you know, this was, my dream was to actually, you know, buy a bike, but I had no dream at the company. It was completely humanless, but if we can build a connection between what drives us and our individual purpose and the purpose of the company, and if we can work together in this congruent fashion, 
then you know magical things happen, which is what I've seen at Best Buy. The results Best Buy has achieved over the last several years are completely irrational. You know, going from hundred, you know, eleven dollars to one hundred and ten, it should not have happened except by unleashing this uh, this human magic. And this question, but tell me about your dream, was part of this. The other example along the same lines. When I was interviewed one day for a, a job before Best Buy. Marilyn Carlson Nelson, who was interviewing me, uh, said, Hubert, tell me about your soul. Who asked this question, right? Are we supposed to be just machines, right? And, you know, get things done and so forth, but yet we're human beings. So for me, I started maybe to become a better leader when I stopped disconnected my head from the rest of my body. And if you can connect, you know, your head and your heart and your soul and your guts, so many great things happen. And I think that's one of the things we, we did learn during the you know, pandemic crisis is leading with all of our body parts. Absolutely. I think one of the things that, that many listeners and viewers are most interested in these days are the, the unique strategies and practices that leaders in high stress, high pressure positions use to keep themselves grounded. And one of the things that I was most interested in was your uh, discussion in the Heart of Business talking about the fact that you actually engaged in a two year long program with other executives studying the teachings of Ignatius de Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit tradition. I'd love to hear more about that. Why did you do it? What did you get out of that? So this was a, uh, a significant milestone in my life. I was in my early 40s. And uh, in a sense, you know, I had climbed up the first mountain. I'd been quite successful. I'd been a consultant at McKinsey. I'd led a couple of businesses. But I, when I got to the top of that first mountain, I felt emptiness. You know, I'd been driven by performing, and at the top, it was it was empty. It was it was not fulfilling spiritually. So um, I ran into this. So it's the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola. Normally, it's done in four weeks. If you're a priest, you're going to do this in four weeks. I'm not a priest, but uh, this was offered over a period of two years. And it's one of the ways, uh, there's other ways you can use, but it's one of the ways to get regrounded. So this approach led me to revisit my life, look in my life at uh, you know, the times when I felt energy and a spiritual presence versus the times where I was more drained and less happy. It led me to uh, try to reflect and meditate and pray. You know, all of us are gonna approach this differently, uh, around what path do I want to follow? You know, what kind of life do I want to have? What is my calling? It's a, it's a lifelong journey, right, to discover our calling and the meaning of our life and our purpose in life. Uh, and then discover that in the same way that we need to eat and physically exercise, we need spiritual exercises. We need to have somehow, again, everybody's going to do it differently, take care of our spiritual life. And uh, that helped me be more grounded, take more time taking care of myself, which again, you know, when the, remember the days when we were flying and the plane would come down and, you know, the steward would tell you, you know, this, put the oxygen mask on yourself first before, so that you can help others, so help yourself. And so that was a, uh, uh, a learning and, it helped me craft my purpose in life. And that's, a, again, that's a lifelong journey. Today, my purpose, the way I would define it, is to try to make a positive difference on people around me and use the platform I have to uh, make a positive difference uh, in the world, which for me today is helping the next generation of leaders. That's why I'm teaching at Harvard and writing this book and coaching and mentoring, you know, and help the next generation of leaders tackle these vast problems we, we have. So I'm more defined by my purpose than my job. I, I, when I was CEO of Best Buy, I actually said, I am not the CEO of Best Buy. I have this job temporarily. One day I won't have this job. I'll still be me and I can still pursue my purpose. I think that's an important distinction. And let, let's actually drill a little bit further into your evolution as a leader. In the book, Hubert, you talk about how over time, you came to realize that one of your 
uh, quirks, you could say, as a leader was that you ha had gotten into the habit of adding too much value and that over time you realized that this actually was a liability. Can you talk about what you mean by that and how you learned to rein this in? Yeah, and just before I answer that, I want to call out, you know, Dory, your upcoming book to, to the previous question, right? It's going to be called The Long Game. It's coming out later this year. And you know, I've talked about your book. You've uh, shared it with me. You, you, talk, you talk about the same thing, right? It's, it's uh, Maybe you want to say a few words. This is the, you know, few minute infomercial by Dory about the long game. How cool is that? Uh, it's very, very kind you, Bear. Thank you. Yes, uh, September 21st from Harvard Business Review, Review Press, which is also, of course, the publisher of You Bear's new book, The Heart of Business. Uh, the long game is, it's basically about how to become a long-term thinker in a short-term world. There's so much pressure on us at the corporate level, at the individual level, to constantly be thinking about the short term, the next quarter, the quick hit. And instead, that is so often it leads us in a direction that we don't even want to end up in. And so it's about how do you have the, the strength and the perspicacity and the perseverance to do the sometimes harder thing that will get us in the end to where we do want to go. So we must be brothers and sisters from a different mother, because I think that these are the same thoughts, right? It's be driven by some kind of North Star and keep going uh, through the present with this North Star uh, in mind. To, to your question about uh, adding too much value. So I think one of the beliefs I have today is that so much of what I learned, so much of what we learned uh, you know, at business school or at McKinsey or in my early years as an executive is either wrong, dated, or certainly incomplete. And it's this uh, vision of, one of the things is th this vision of leadership as you know, the smartest person in the room. Uh, who is the superhero who is going to save the day through their own, you know, strengths. Somebody who, by the way, is often driven by power, fame, glory, or money. And it's all about them. And I think this is so much 20th century. So we're well into the 21st century. So it's time to reinvent our vision of, uh, of leadership. And the danger, so oftentimes in our early years, we, we progress because, you know, because of our talent and our gifts and being smart. And so that's helpful. But there's a point where being too smart and adding too much value is actually disruptive. Because imagine a team coming to my office. They've come up with an idea. They're very excited about it. And of course, I'm smart. So I want to make sure they know how smart I am. So I'm going to tell them two or three things where they can improve. And one of the things I've learned is before I do this, wait seven seconds and say, is it going to make a real difference, positive difference, or are, is it going to demoralize them and say, oh, you know, why isn't Dutchie talking about the rest? And so one of the things I've learned, Dory, is that our role as a leader is, again, much more to create this environment in which others can be successful. And it's this other question of who do we serve as a leader? It's one of the things we, we talk about in the book, right? So I've told, I've told our officers at Best Buy, if you're serving yourself or your boss or me as the CEO of the company, it's okay. I don't have a problem with that, except you cannot work here, right? <laughs> you can be promoted to being a Best Buy customer, which is a very exciting position that I highly recommend, but you cannot work here. On the other end, if you see that you're serving people on the front line, your team and people on the front line, then we're game. And that's this mind shift. And I had, it, this was really difficult for me because I grew up very brainy. I thought that logic and facts and problem solving was you know, the key thing. But no, I needed to shift from solving problems directly, which sometimes I still had to do you know, when we decided to match Amazon's prices, that, that was a good decision. But for the most part, it's much more about being an architect in creating the environment in which you know, this human magic can be uh, unleashed. This is a journey, it's really hard. And I have to give credit to my coach at the time, Marshall Goldsmith, the father of all coaches, right? Uh, who saw my quirks, he's written this great book, you know, what got you here won't get you there. In that book, he's got a list of the 20 quirks of successful people. 
when I started to work with Marshall, I had 13 out of the 20 quarks. <laughs> and now, I mean, it's in infomercials, the before and after picture. I've worked hard to change that. And I think that uh, and I've, the way I've learned is through Marshall and then watching other great leaders at, uh, at Best Buy do their thing. So it's a, but that was difficult, I would admit. Absolutely. Uh, ch changing and growing in a as a leader is never easy. Now, you alluded to this, Uber, at the beginning of our conversation. I think it's, it's worth returning to because it's an important theme, I know, in your work, something you're very concerned about. And certainly it's part of the societal question right now is diversity. Now, this is something that for a long time in fits and starts, the corporate world has paid lip service to, but hasn't, hasn't necessarily been as effective as it could be in really making it real. What are your thoughts about the way that, that more diversity and inclusion should be done? How can we get this right? So uh, thank you for this question because it's so essential. And uh, uh, I start with the individual level. Right, because you go back to this idea, the company is a human organization made of individuals working together in pursuit of a goal. And forget about size, whether it's a hundred person company or a million people, it's still one individual at a time. My compatriot, the philosopher René Descartes of the Cartesian philosophy said a long time ago, I think therefore I am. <clears throat> I think he's wrong. It is, I am seen, therefore I am. I remember talking with one of our associates in the Best Buy store. He told me, my life changed the day a manager recognized me and took an interest in me and invested in my development. Before I am seen, therefore I am. And it's the sense of belonging that we need to create. And it's one associate at a time. Now, of course, we cannot be blind. Beyond the individual, there's some systemic issues around, in particular, gender and race. And intellectually, there's a lot of studies that show that diverse organizations are more effective. You know, if companies don't represent the communities they serve, they're going to miss, right? There's a, an example. Uh, in the old days, it's been fixed, and that, uh, you know, the, the, the cameras in the smartphones didn't do a good job of taking pictures of black individuals because infrared technology doesn't good, do, do a good job with, red, with, with black. And so if you didn't have any black engineers or leaders, or if you didn't know anybody black, you would miss. So it's vital to have diversity uh, of thoughts, of perspective, but also backgrounds at every level in the organization. Another example in, Chica in some parts of Chicago, if the staff, the salespeople don't speak Polish, you're going to miss. Or in some parts of Florida, if they don't speak Portuguese, you know, where the, the Brazilian tourists used to come, you were also going to miss. To your point, if we look in particular around gender and certainly race and certainly around uh, Black and African-American colleagues, companies have been on the diversity and inclusion journey for a long time. We have to say it out loud with no results, no satisfactory results. And so for me, what does it take? And I've been on this journey. I'm very proud when I stepped down, when I passed the baton at Best Buy, passed the baton to an amazing woman, Corey Barry. And our board was majority women, and we had three black directors. And during my time there, half of my direct reports were women were not perfect, but I felt we had made some progress. The first thing is the is a personal journey. So one day, I realized that the level of employee engagement varied significantly across gender and race. So I did focus groups. What I realized is that our Black African-American colleagues, the pain level was orders of magnitude more significant than for other groups. And I kicked myself because I had failed to see that. And so, but that started me on a journey to listen and learn. So I got a reverse mentor, the wonderful Laura Gladney, young African-American woman. I grew up in France, so there's racism in France, but it's different. And so I had so much to learn and she taught me. Uh, I also went to see Melody Hobson, who's the, the wonderful leader in Chicago at Air Investment, who uh, is a pioneer and, and a great spokesperson. And, and she taught me uh, and I spoke with a bunch of uh, 
black leaders who shared with me their experience. And so I understood not only with my head, but also with my heart. And uh, one of the things that makes me optimistic today, Dory, makes me optimistic that this generation can solve systemic racism in the US in the next few years, is that more and more leaders go through that personal journey of truly and listening and understanding. And then if, you, if you've done that, you cannot stand still, you have to fix it. And so then you go, you see it as a business problem. And in America, we know how to develop strategies and implement strategies. And so I'm very, uh, if we stay with it, I think we have the opportunity to fix that for the, for the long term. Thank you for that, Hubert. It's a thoughtful answer to a, a challenging issue. We have time for probably just a couple of more quick questions. Something that I wanted to turn to, I know that as, a, uh, as an outside observer of Best Buy over the years and during your tenure, one of the places where Best Buy was most in the news and, and frankly was most lauded was your response during Hurricane Maria. Tell us a little bit more, what did you do in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria and why did you do it? Yeah, so Maria was a disaster right, for, for, for the island. And the, we had three stores on the island, a warehouse. And while it's an island, the US Navy was not called to the rescue. So we were very worried about our, our team. And so uh, on Monday during our executive team meeting, we said, you know, the only thing I said is that we need to take care of our employees. And it didn't get into the details, but our team then, you know, went on to uh, a campaign. Um, our regional manager hired private planes to bring food uh, and, and water and money to the islands, be able to repatriate, you know, people to the uh, mainland who, for those who, uh, who, who want it. She's, at some point, she joking and said, how do I get a private plane? Do I charge it on my credit card? <laughs> she just made it happen. Then, you know, the, the stores were closed, but we continue with the employees on the payroll, provided that they would help with the reconstruction of the island. And then ultimately, we reopened the, the stores. Now, other companies did great things as well, but the, the learning for me and for the company was, we're a human organization, so of course we're going to take care of our employees. And then there's the power of stories. We never advertised it externally, but we share that story internally and say, this is who we are. We take care of the family. And then what's extraordinary is that after the stores reopened, the sales were materially up on the island for Best Buy because customers felt that we were genuine people and that we had taken care. And, and the employees, I mean, their heart in the business was like, you know, in no other time. So, this was a great uh, learning experience. And again, it's this idea that at the heart of business, you have this purpose, and then you have the, the people and the humanity, and that's how you lead. That's fascinating. Thank you for, for sharing that. It's a, a real testament to your commitment to your people. And the last question that I think is probably on a lot of people's minds, folks who are watching this some of them are, are CEOs and senior leaders, but many of them who are watching are less far along in their careers. They may be young professionals. They may be uh, climbing the ranks of management. Over time, I know now you are teaching. You're teaching at Harvard Business School. What advice would you give someone today who aspires to be a, a leader in a corporation what, what have you learned and how would you counsel them to approach this? So first thing is beware. Beware of the seduction of power, fame, glory, or money. Anytime in my life I've been seduced uh, or about to be seduced by one of these things, it was better if I said, time out, slow down. Let's rethink what we want to do. Second is pace yourself. You know, nothing is going to, not everything is going to happen over time. And, you know, the idea of in the first phase of your career, build foundations, learn and build capabilities that are going to be, you know, good for you over time. And the third thing I would say is that over time, try to discover your purpose, the meaning of your life and what kind of leader you want to be. A good exercise 
that uh, we recommend to our coaching clients is write down your eulogy. What would you like people to say, you know, on that day where you're not going to be around to listen? Uh, and write it down and then use that as the North Star, you know, for, for your life and to make decisions uh, about your life. And last thing I would say is uh, don't forget to enjoy the journey and take care of yourself back to this meditation, taking care of your spiritual life, your personal life, trying to live an integrated life, right? There's not you in the office, you at home, you know, you have a professional life, a, a personal life, a social life, a family life. Try to live this in an integrated fashion, all oriented towards that uh, single purpose and, and the meaning of your life. So these are some governing thoughts. Now listen to me, I'm like preaching, I know all of the answers. This is hard. All of us are on this, uh, uh, on, on this journey, but uh, you asked me, so here it is. Thank you for sharing that, Uber. That's fantastic. And I understand that you actually have a free resource for people who are interested in learning more about developing their skills and getting, getting tuned into the heart of business. Is that correct? Yeah, thank you, Dory. And I'm, I, I must say, I'm very excited about the launch of the book. I, you know, one of my goals is to put the, the book into as many heads and, and hearts as, as possible, uh, again, with this idea of helping the next generation. So uh, a couple of, uh, of ideas. So if you go to Hubert Jolie, which is my first name, my last name, .org slash SXSW, South by Southwest, there's, yeah, there's going to be free resources to help you uh, assess and understand the heart of your business. So a bit of a self-diagnosis tool, which is a special gift to the Southwest, uh, South by Southwest audience. And then the second thing, if we, you know, if you want to continue on the journey as we progress uh, and get some updates and news, text 55444, excuse me, text human magic, text the word human magic, just one word to 55. 444 and this will be this will give you a way to stay in touch with us so thank you so much dorian thank you so much everyone for for listening we are at a pivotal time you know the future is not written yet and we have the opportunity as human beings to invent a future that does not exist yet but that hopefully is more sustainable more just and more rewarding for uh, everyone i think we can do this I think you're right. Hubert Jolie, you are the author of the new book, The Heart of Business, out from Harvard Business Review Press. Thank you, Hubert, and thank you to all South by Southwest participants for tuning in. Thanks. Thank you, Dari.